The artificial intelligence takeover is escalating as big tech companies like Microsoft and Alphabet double down on their exposure. But one company is already taking it to the next level. Figure has announced a new funding round today as it pushes forward on its development of its autonomous humanoid robot. Brett Adcock, Figure founder and CEO, joins us now alongside Yahoo Finance executive editor Brian Sazi. So, Brett, let's get right into this. The robot, what is its purpose? Yeah, well, <clears throat> thanks for having me on this morning. Um, yeah, so figures designing um, and commercializing autonomous humanoid robots. Uh, these are robots that have two legs, two arms, hands, can basically operate in a physical environment similar to humans. Um, our vision here is to deploy these robots to do physical labor. So we want these robots to do um, you know, physical tasks in the real world, such as warehousing, manufacturing, retail. We see enormous amount of um, unemployment happening and just uh, an overall kind of like flat line in the, basically the, the amount of people in the workforce. And we really hope humanoid robotics can help on the automation side, kind of fill that void and do jobs that are dangerous, monotonous, boring. Brett, Brian here, good to, uh, good to speak with you. $70 million, it's a lot of money. Where are you going to spend it? And do you have orders for these products yet? Yeah, well, first off, um, we, we announced a $70 million Series A today led by Parkway Venture Capital and a bunch of other just really great venture capitalists and investors. Um, we're gonna spend that money on four areas over the next 24 months. Uh, the first is overall robot development. So we've finished our first generation robot that um, is fully assembled, moving our lab now. We're on to our second generation. Um, we're working on manufacturing. Um, we're building out and designing an end-to-end -end AI data engine. And then we're working on our commercial go-to-market. Um, on that topic, we are in pretty deep discussions at this point with a few of the top tier kind of, you know, household name groups in the U.S. Uh, to deploy the humanoids into areas where these companies are seeing like significant labor shortages in overall jobs that are dangerous and repetitive that we can go in and help automate. Brent, I'm curious why it has to be humanoid. In other words, I think about, for example, an auto assembly line where a lot of that is automated by um, different types of robotic uh, robots, I guess, functions. Um, what are the situations where specifically a humanoid would be necessary? Like, give us some examples. Yeah, I think like for the most part, so many things have been automated today that are like that are relatively easy. So you walk in a you know manufacturing facility and warehouse, anything that could be automated has basically been done. Um, we think the advantage to a humanoid form is um, being able to do, kind of do anything a human can in the physical world. Uh, so that means you know in in a warehouse, that means interacting with shelves, move, moving items, unloading trucks, depalletizing, restocking shelves. Um, we we view like the the labor population at this point. Basically, the labor population is flatlining uh, globally. Uh, baby boomers, like, you know, demographically, the baby boomers have retired, are retiring. We haven't had as many children as we probably want. And we're basically having a huge issue in the labor population. So in the U.S. alone, there's what, almost 11 million jobs that are just not wanted. And we really hope humanoids can basically move into a world that was built for humans and seamlessly uh, interact with that world and do work. So our goal is for to put humanoids in these initial areas and warehousing, manufacturing, and retail uh, to basically fill that labor void. Uh, over time, our humanoids should be able to do anything a human can. Uh, that will take like a, a lot of time and development for us to get you know all the way there end to end, but that's the aspiration we have. Brett, we were just showing a side-by-side -side graphic, your robot versus Tesla's Optimus robot. How far ahead is Tesla? Are they even ahead at this point? Yeah, um, you know, I don't, I can't really speak to like maybe what Tesla's doing internally, but at least for us, we finished our full scale development of our humanoid in December. Uh, we just got the robot fully brought up and put together a few months ago. And as of last week, we did our first robot steps. Uh, so the robot actually did its first, uh, you know, basically steps in the office, like our first baby. What was steps. the office, Brett? What was the office vibe when you saw that? That's kind of creepy. Uh, yeah. yeah, the it was incredible. I mean, we worked so hard for last year and to see something actually go from like, you know, digital, like say software or CAD into like a physical, you know, embodied robot and actually work was a, just a huge payoff for the team. And now coming off this funding round, we actually have the 
capital to make really large scale investments into the engineering and product side. I mean, the, we're we're roughly 50 people today and it's, you know, arguably one of the best teams in humanoid robotics. So yeah, we're all pretty fired up and we basically have, you know, a vision now into the next 24 months to demonstrate commercial viability and then ultimately getting to market and proving that humanoids can be, you know, helpful to society. So to, to uh, elaborate further or to take uh, Brian's question out further, Brett, just about the competitive landscape. What does it look like for you when you think about, because first, initially when you saw stuff like this, you think Boston Dynamics, uh, and now you have the Tesla bot and you all. Uh, so how are you all going to stay competitive with a heavy hitter like a Tesla? Uh, again, I'll be, I agree, this is a little creepy to me. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think like the, the heritage in humanoid robotics the last 10 years has, has been like very deep in R&D. Like there's been a lot of research and development groups like Boston Dynamics, uh, IHMC, uh, Honda had Asimo projects. So Toyota had a project doing humanoid robotics. Uh, there, for us, we look at um, where, where are the commercial groups look, looking like? Um, who's got robots that can walk, can have hands that can manipulate ob and move objects to the world? have the right capital uh, to really get this done and have the right commercial viability to bring into market. Uh, we think there's very few companies in the world uh, that have the ability to kind of do that today. Um, I think what Tesla is doing is, is incredible. We're, 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 we're watching from afar and rooting for them. Uh, and here internally, we feel there's a, you know, a chance for us to hopefully in the next 24 months to demonstrate and then commercialize the technology, which I, I think will be really incredible. I think that'll feel like 50 years of the future got pulled forward. And I think having humanoids in the economy will be just a, a huge benefit and we can really help fill a, a really big void in the economy that's happening today. Um, Brett, you're probably familiar with the comments that Elon Musk has been making pretty consistently about AI and the dangers of AI, and he's not the only one. And we refer frequently in this conversation to the creepiness, right? To the, there was this unsettling nature to having a humanoid robot. If you've got a humanoid robot and AI, how do you reassure people <laughs> about that sort of psychological, uh, emotional response to something like that? Yeah, I think it starts from the top. Like our goal is not to basically develop and design <clears throat> an unsafe product. Uh, we won't do any military or law enforcement work uh, ever. I wrote about this uh, in kind of the company manifesto. And, you know, we spend a lot of time on cybersecurity, just the hardware, uh, side of things and the software side of things to make sure that we're designing a safe robot. We're ultimately designing an electromechanical robot, so it's fully electric. Um, I would like almost think of this as almost like a, uh, we don't want to design a very heavy duty robot. We basically want to design a robot that can basically do the minimally viable of what humans can, move light payloads around, help do work. So we're, we're really designing a labor tool. We, we want to basically design, you know, automation that can help the world and do all these things in the economy that we don't have people to do today. You walk in any manufacturing or warehouse facility today, it's it's not as if we were taking people's jobs. They're having, you know, two percent weekly attrition, over over 100 percent annual turnover. These jobs are walking 10 plus miles a day, picking 50 items an hour in very hot warehouses. We feel like there's a real need to help fill this problem in the society, and we hope right. that. A humanoid will be able to interact with that. So our view is to hopefully design design a really uh, important product and a really safe product that can that can do well for humanity long term. And I think there's a real path to do that, but we have to do that very thoughtfully. Right, and it not necessarily thinking for itself and becoming our new robot overlords. It sounds like more of service tool. Brad Adcock, a figure founder and CEO, really fascinating conversation. Thank you so much, and Yahoo Finance executive editor Brian Sazi joining us for that convo as well. Thank you.